Hi there, everybody. This is James Chai, RFARF Bark Bark Rescue Foundation. I work with the predatorial dogs. I work with extremely dangerous dogs, and I develop an aspect of reading the dogs, um, psychological issues at the root basis. And I do that at about two tenths of a second, and I have 100% accuracy. I'm most well known for working with extremely dangerous dogs, weighing over 150 pounds. Media links are in the uh, uh, description uh, and you go to my links and so forth on rfrfbarkbark.com and look under media links you will see um, uh, quotes and references from uh, national television etc and so forth like that so it's just going to get started on here I ran a little bit late I apologize um, it's about 8 51 p.m. here on the west coast uh, Vancouver it was almost uh, I think 32 degrees this morning so it was quite chilly and um, for those of us in Canada, that's zero degrees. And I, I'm, let me just see it. Okay. So uh, what I posted off today is uh, for October 10th, 2019, episode number 16. Like I said, I am going to try to keep doing this on a regular basis, like as often as I can during the day. Uh, but it does take a bit out of me. Uh, like I say, it takes me about four to six hours to do everything. Um, but I'm, I'm doing that. And I want to just give every piece of information that I can, leave a digital legacy. And then in 50 years, 100 years from now, when people start realizing that dogs are sentient and that there is a psychogenetic, a psychological root aspect of dogs' behavior, uh, the the understanding of the psychosis of the dog themselves. Uh, I think I was just talking to, um, uh, not thinking, I was talking to Jackie, who runs an awesome Massive Lovers group, and she has a show dog, a show Dane as well. I talked to her tonight about uh, an issue that she was having with her Dane. Um, and I explained a whole bunch of stuff to her in regards to the psychological aspects of it. And she was like, wow. And then I also explained um, what her dog's behavior is just by looking at the picture of her dog, the way her dog holds herself, the fit structure of her dog, the way the veins have developed in the dog's body, the way she holds her eyes and so forth. And I said, this is the kind of behavior that she has, which is essentially uh, her Dane will just kind of look. And then after about two or three uh, tenths of a second, she'll start to roll on in her ability to be reactive. Uh, not reactive, but to be instant on in regards to energy, and then just dealing with some other aspects of her behavior. How you can tell that she's a left handed turning dog versus a right handed turning dog when she lays down. We can see these things in the behavior of the dogs and the physical aspect of the dogs. This is stuff that I have developed over 1400 days and over 20,000 hours literally alone with dogs that are significantly giant. Again, everything I am saying is truthful, there's no embellishment. I don't need to embellish. I can back it up every single time, uh, media links as well, confirm it, etc, etc. I uh, just, just want everyone to know that I am committed to the lives of dogs and again, the more I can teach everybody, uh, the happier I am. There's some background noise which is coming from Anthony who is eating a beef bone, a raw beef bone, which means that there will be other dogs who are coming in here that they'll try to have some sort of aspects of resource uh, um, attempts and I will correct them and just verbally like I have been doing live all the time you talk to your dog in conversational tone it will work every single time as long as you establish that relationship and you treat your dog as your child on a rudimentary aspect of emotional and logical processing as well as keeping in the context that they are extremely dangerous dogs they are always a predator even the chihuahua can kill you know, they kill a mouse, they, they, they're, they're capable of and they're aware of it. So what, you ought to be uh, aware of that. Uh, the subject lines on this are going to be, but it's probably not going to be because, uh, like I said, I kind of fell behind a little bit. I'm going to try to actually get to more of the third part. So the first one is pack or group of dogs. And that's, you know, dysfunctional dogs, making sure the dogs aren't attacking each other. The other one is dogs love hugs. And uh, and then the next one is viewers and members questions. So um, the viewers who are on my regular page and the members who are asking in-depth questions in my uh, reactive dog group. And like I say, you can go to rfrfbarkbark.com and go under the tab that says help your for your dog, free for your dog. And those members can come into my group. You know, you just have to subscribe to my YouTube channel. You have to uh, subscribe to my Twitter, etc. You go online. And then I will be answering, uh, that's Anthony, and then I'll be answering questions uh, in the member section, which are much more detailed versus the stuff that people are saying uh, on my main page, which is just a couple of comments and all that, which are rudimentary, you know, basic information. But again, the stuff that is uh, more detailed, 
people are asking in my closed group. And again, you're more than welcome to do that. Uh, I want to thank, um, uh, uh, I, I put out yesterday that I, you know, started up a, do a donation of fundraisers on Patreon and GoFundMe. And the, uh, I want to say thank you to Christina S. Uh, for donating um, um, uh, yesterday. Uh, it was an incredibly pleasant surprise, really lovely. So that brings up the total now uh, of uh, the donations to $200. And so once I hit uh, $250, then I will uh, essentially post on Facebook for local people here on a fixed income for uh, just basically saying, do you have a reactive dog? You do? Okay, let's figure out who has the reactive dog. And then viewers or, or uh, visitors to my page can comment on whoever it is that has that reactive dog. And they will get a question on me. It'll be filmed on video, etc. So you get to see the actual... Blah, 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 blah. This is the problem. I have my dog. This is what my dog looks like. You hear me talking about it. Then I'll video it in an actual session that you get to watch. And then you go on from there. So this is what I'm saying. I put the truth behind my words. Uh, the donations are going that you donate are going to help your fellow dog owners who are on fixed incomes. It's going to people who can't afford it but love their dog. And that's always the toughest part because our only emotional contact, uh, contact a lot of times is with our dog. Uh, where we can truly feel that we're safe and people who who, um, who struggle to make ends meet um, is something that we as our community of human beings need to do so so um, all the stuff is going to happen and then like the free follow-up as well in regards to uh, online phone call advice and so forth like that so it's going to be a full aspect of it They're doing anthony It's like the bone is like this big, and it's, it, you can't even see it in his mouth. It, it's so funny, these, these these Danes, right? He's like 160 pounds now. And then Sammy's uh, wanting to come over here. And, and uh, okay. Uh, and Anthony used to have a, he had a little bit of reactivity when it came to food. Uh, you know, and it's always that fear because, you know, the dogs I'm dealing with, they're always reactive. Uh, you know, a lot of times are resource guarding, so I'm always worried about it. And I have to put my hand down to go pick up the bowl. Uh, while they're still there and I work with them, there's been times where I've been bitten on the thigh and it hurts quite a bit. There's a lot of bruising. Um, I've been bitten in the hand and so forth like that as well, going to reach for stuff like that. I'm always scared poopless. I'm always, always scared. Uh, you know, it even comes to the point where um, if I go and uh, I talk about giving our dogs a hug, dogs trust and all that. Even when I, like I said before, is when I go to give a, even a golden retriever that's super friendly and I give him a hug. In my head, I can see the nuances and the behavior of that particular dog and how it can, that dog can be triggered over a succession of behaviors towards that dog to cause that dog to be reactive. And it's really kind of a, a it's a gift that I have, but it's also sometimes um, causes me a little bit of stress. Uh, so, okay, so we're going to go on that part. Um, you know, again, thank you to Christina S. for uh, the, your donation and uh, previous people with Justin and um, the other person who is anonymous. Um, there are the links in my uh, my description uh, regards to supporting and subscribing my work, helping to spread my word. I want to thank everybody. I'm now up to 430. Anthony, stop. Okay, so Mickey's come down to pick up the bone right now. There it is. There's no there's no issue. They're literally beside each other. There it is. What, I, let's see. See? That's there. Right there. See? Stop. Minky, stop. They're right beside it. Minky. Minky. There. And, and he's gone. So that's it. The conversation that we have with our dogs works absolutely every single time. It's respectful. It's in the proper tone, the voice key of the dog, uh, of our dog, so that they understand that tone and what we're talking about by watching the body language as they're responsive to what we're doing. There you go, right there, right? So proof right there in the pudding as well. Same thing like when Lincoln was barking out the window. Told him to stop, stop yelling, stop, watch his timing, got him to stop. It all works. There's no treats, there's no medication, there's no, uh, uh, there's no Lima, there's no um, archaic aspects of uh, correlating to Pavlov, who, who, you know, I say, treats, food does not exist anywhere in the entire canine species. So, why, why, are, uh, why are people like, uh, you know, Ian Dunbar saying that you need to use treats, right? They're like, I just did it. And these are all resource guarding dogs. And, and Erica Kelly, who uh, brought uh, Le uh, Anthony up to me, she can attest to you that he's actually, uh, you know, if you ever, if you know, you can ask what he was like. Um, uh, so, and same with Minky from Animal Foundation, uh, which I'm starting to post some of his stuff there. Uh, you'll see I'll be posting four videos of his over the next few days in regards to his development and his growth and uh, how uh, Animal Hope and Wellness Foundation has rescued over 20,000 dogs, 
20,000 dogs, including from the meat dog trade, dog farms, etc. Severe abuse, extreme abuse cases. And this is the Minky was a one dog that they could not figure out after four months. They have a, a well known behavior on the board of directors. They couldn't do it. They reached out to me for help. And, you know, of course, the agreement that we have is for them to share my work. And uh, I think that's where after a year I'm getting a little bit tired here of, of asking for something when I give my word on something I expect other people to do. Too. Um, so there's that. I'm just ranting. You know what? I just figured this vlog is my vlog. I'm going to do it. Um, you know, some people tell me, oh, you should do it this way, you should do it that way, you should be commercialized and all that. But you know what? I'm just going to do what I'm doing. I'm leaving the legacy. I'm not under anyone's salary. You ain't owning me. You ain't my boss. So I'm just going to do whatever I'm doing. Uh, if you pick it up, you pick it up. If you don't, you don't. I have a, I'm opinionated. People say that locally, especially my trolls, other trainers and behaviors in town, like Sheila Begg, uh, Dr. Rebecca Ledger, they, they troll me. They troll me publicly. Whatever. Do whatever you want. End of the day, uh, what I do, I can prove it. And, um, you know, uh, I'm just going to do what I'm doing. People who said they were going to help me, they don't, whatever. I, I just do your own thing, right? Do your own thing. And I've learned that. Uh, to rely on people who promised me the moon, you know, nothing. And they're not even trying to have me, okay? So, you know, haha. <laughs> so, that's making a joke. All right. Um, one thing I wanted to talk about as well as I'm thinking of doing here locally in Vancouver is a coffee meet, a meetup, right? You know, like that. I'm not going to do the meetup thing, whatever. But um, I, I want to do a, uh, a Christina, like I was telling you about it. So, I, I want to do a coffee meetup. Where just I'll go to a restaurant or somewhere and we'll figure out and a bunch of people, one person or five people can show up who have dogs and want to ask me questions. And we just hang out for two, three hours and talking about dogs, right? I mean, obviously I love that. Uh, you know, I'm not going to charge for it. Maybe I might ask for donations to help fund for future stuff. But it's just be a, a meetup. You want to ask questions about your dog? Ask questions, right? People are asking me here. I've got a guy, uh, a Matt, who, who I'm going to be answering his Twitter question about his Shiba Inu. And, um, uh, you know, uh, you're welcome. Thank you as well, Christina. Um, and so what will end up happening is I'm just going to keep doing this. We're supposed to help each other. This is what the world is all about. We're supposed to help each other. Um, it's just part of our compassion that, you know what? All the stuff that I'm doing, I could have easily followed the clicks around here. I could have followed the groups of, you know, people who really... Uh, yeah, I'm going to take donations for sure. i got to pay my bills, trust me. I, I drive a little hybrid. I'm like, how much gas do I got today? Um, but the thing is, uh, you know, uh, I have this gift. It's a rare, a very rare gift that comes from God. And uh, this is my personal belief in that part of it. But in, in my mandate is I believe that I should be sharing what I uh, have been given and shared with me to share with the rest of the world. And the work is, is, is you know, 20,000 plus dogs, Animal Hope and Wellness Foundation, and connections to, you know, Hollywood, Matt Damon, all these people and all that stuff. They came and they knew I was the only one that could do it. Same with uh, Tonka that I posted earlier today on my Facebook page. Over 300,000 views. Significantly predatorial dog. I took him for free. right? And I lose uh, quite a bit of money on that end. But it is what we're supposed to do to help. And if I have to lead by example, I will. I mean, just, you know, I, I'll do it. I mean, I'm going to help. Uh, please make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Uh, uh, follow me on Twitter, follow me on Instagram if you can, please. That'd be great just to build up the numbers again. I am extremely uh, grateful for people who are uh, following me, who are listening, and um, you know, they've been, they, I get messages uh, almost on a daily basis now from people who've like, I saw your thing. I'm like, you did? Wow, okay. That's, and I'm kind of like, oh, wow. I'm a little shy about that. And they say, yeah, and I tried this stuff and it's, and it's working. I'm like, well, that's what it's meant, right? Like I said yesterday, somebody uh, was going to hire me and they, they canceled and they said, you know, I just want to follow the stuff that you're doing online. Perfect. Do it. That's fine. Just because then that leaves room for you to learn, teach other people as well, refer people who have more serious issues, so forth like that. And what we do as a whole is to help fellow human beings. Um, it's a tough thing. It's really tough. I've been attacked a lot, been trolled. Like I said, people uh, have published the, the address of my ex-wife and, uh, uh, and, and children. Um, they've done some really, really cruel, evil things. And uh, you know what? Here I am. Here I am. I might not conform to the people who are in the corporate world go and say, well, you know, you should do this to do this to be famous or to be popular. I'm just going to do the honest way. You know, follow my destiny.
Um, okay, uh, the other links there are for Patreon and for GoFundMe for donations. Again, uh, $250 pays for a cost of, uh, of another person's um, uh, fixed income for their dog that really needs it. And uh, you, the, the viewers, will vote on it. If you go back and look um, a while back, there was a video I did for Axel, uh, the German Shepherd Shearoad, uh, who was deemed dangerous by animal control, uh, attacking people, attacking dogs. Uh, and then he bit family members, including two in the face, uh, two of them at different times in the face, and uh, did did the session for free. Uh, I was getting sponsored by Hemp My Pet, HempMyPet.com. Hi, Gina, uh, and HempMyPet.com, an amazing company. They they came up and they, uh, I got nothing to show them, right? And they said we're just gonna, you know, do you want to do some contests? We'll we'll help sponsor you and so forth like that. So all these things. Um, you know, they're great. Uh, they would send me some product from Nero, uh, and it kept Nero alive for two and a half years. It got him at 10 years, four months of age. His back end started going after about four or five months. I thought he was actually dying, right, because of his age, because he'd been caged for seven years for breeding, chained up for three years after that with a prong collar outside, extremely reactive, dragged a human being off the couch. You can read that, uh, some of the blurb there in, in an earlier post with regards to uh, Tonka and, and uh, Nero and Minky in that one picture where uh, Walter's laying sideways on a five by seven carpet and he's five feet longer you know so um three reactive dogs all cohabitating in the same area all antisocial dogs all dog 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 reactive just working them in that end and that's what we're doing right so we can connect and we can make them feel safe all right so um uh tonight's live broadcast I, i'm gonna confirm again that i'm just doing the vlogging uh, I'm not going to do commenting uh, because it takes me so long, four to six hours, just doing this. Like, it will take, I won't be finished till, uh, last night I didn't get it post up till about 3 a.m. in the morning. And I may be up till 4 a.m. in the morning because I have other people to talk to as well in different parts of the world. Um, and I actually fell asleep at my kitchen table and I woke up and I got a sore neck and two hours later I'm like, oh, okay, well, I've, and I haven't gone back to sleep. So I've had two hours of sleep in like, uh, in like 40 hours now. Um. So I'm just going to keep doing this. I just love what I do. I'm very fortunate. And, um, you know, I have a rare gift that I am sharing. Okay, so uh, I'm going to vlog instead. And everyone knows who's been following me that I am wildly organic. So I go all over the place. But my brain is always just going. And, and you know, if you could see what I can see in your dog, you would fall in love with your dog again. You would fall in love with your family again. You would fall in love with the humans in your life again. Uh, in a new way, in this incredibly viscerally beautiful, gorgeous way by falling in love, by seeing them, by seeing the way I see your dogs is amazing. Otto, who had contact me, rest to his dog, um, and, and the situation happened that it wasn't his fault. The dog walker had him, and the situation happened, and all that stuff. And I, he said, Can I talk to you for 10 minutes? I phoned out, we talked for about half an hour, 40 minutes, and it was just basically boom, boom, boom. You know, there's no cost, I don't charge for that because he's uh, he, he has a problem. I help him, we help him through, and all that stuff. And I said to him the same thing as I connect because I gotta I, I gotta I gotta fall in love with your dog. That's the only way We're, we can't help somebody if we don't love them. We can't help a stranger unless we feel love for them. Not a not a not a uh, ulterior uh, motive or whatever, right? So to me, it's like it's always Christmas here. Um, I can't I can't I don't like I said I don't make a lot of money. Uh, I really don't make a lot. I'm renting an old house that's almost 60 years old. So you can imagine how much that's costing because they're letting big dogs in. Um, but, you know, just paying it forward, leaving a legacy, proving to the rest of the world that we don't have to make money off of the uh, desperation that uh, dogs are in and, and humans are in. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, some of the points that I have. I'm just going to go briefly over the points because I've, I've got about six questions that I have I've fallen behind. And one person, Sarah, is back in. Toronto, so she's probably going to fall asleep soon, so I want to answer you first. Uh, Sarah, if you are there, please make a comment, then I'll answer you right away. Otherwise, I may just wait till the next day, and I apologize again. Um, okay, so what I say is, what I teach is not easy for everyone. And the interesting thing about that comment is, uh, like I've been saying and repeatedly saying, it's so simple. Like I talk about uh, with Walter, I start with Tonka, uh, Nero, and, and Minky. I talk about them, and I'm saying, you know, it's intuitive and all that stuff. And I and I have a talent, yes, and I have a rare gift, yes. But what I'm doing is I'm teaching people how to do it themselves, and it's very simple. And so the biggest, most important thing I always say to people is, don't overthink it. And then to maintain it, 
practice, practice, practice. Be consistent, be vigilant. If all else fails, go back to step one. Baby steps, back to step one. Start from there again. If you're having issues, you're finding your dog that, that we've worked together and I've shown you how to reset your dog in a certain way. And when you reset your dog and something happens again, go back to square one. Go back to step one and just do it again. And, and, and reconnect again, right? Hold their hand, reconnect. Feel that connection, that visceral connection, that emotional connection with your dog. And you go from that point. And it's gorgeous, right? It's absolutely gorgeous what we want to do. Um, and I also want to apologize for yesterday. I recorded uh, the blog, uh, the vlog on my desktop, and the pictures were horrible, and the audio was horrible. And I was like, I hate myself now. So I'm going to do it on the cell phone from now on, as long as I have battery power. Um, so, uh, like I say, what I teach is not easy for everyone. If you're overthinking it, absolutely too much. Just keep it really simple. Keep it simple, like the rest of our life is. Like I said, is you know what? When you go watch the sunset with somebody you love, you're holding their hand, and that's it. And you're enjoying it. You're not saying anything to each other. Pretty simple. Do that with your dogs. Just connect to them. Keep it simple. Don't try to overthink them. And just do it that way. Um, uh, you know, I've had people who are extremely intelligent people. Much more intelligent than, than people that I, like even myself, in that sense, not saying I'm really intelligent, but really smart people, just brilliant, successful people. And I'll, and I'll say to them, you know, I got a lot of, when we go through a session, I'll say, I got a lot of information, you know, every single person, not one person has ever said, oh, you didn't give me enough information. Every single person I've worked with for the last uh, three years professionally has all said, oh my gosh, that's too much. I don't think I'm going to remember it all. I've had couples say, yeah, can we have a few days because this is just too much. Can we ask you some questions? right and so it is a lot of information it's overwhelming but i do it because i'm not here to try to make money off of another session off another session all that does is prolong the pain and misery that your dog is suffering from so i'm just going to keep going i'll tell you all the information you have any questions then i'll be more than happy email me text we can have even a short phone call for those clients of mine and then we talk about it work it through baby step and it works great i got a guy who uh, hired um uh, Dr. Claudia Richter uh, is a reasonably known uh, behaviorist here in town. Prescribed uh, uh, several medications for their dog, uh, for his dog, and um, no medication out. So it's just that part of it. Uh, it's just we're always throwing medication, right? You know, behaviorists, right? Animal behaviorists, human behaviorists. What are they doing? They are prescribing medication. They're medicating our children. Now they're medicating our dogs, and we're letting it happen. But then the vets and so forth, they're medicating the dogs. The behaviors are medicating the dogs for psychological issues. Okay, well then why don't we put the medication away for a few days or weeks and let's just connect to our dog emotionally and try to figure out our dog's psychological issues. Let's not try to throw treats and, and food at our dog like as if they're dumb and stupid, which is what it is. If, like I said, you're going out with somebody, you love them, and all they do is buy you toys and candy and trips and all that stuff, and eventually one day you like, I don't know if he actually loves me, right? That's what you think about it, right? Because I say that to women because it doesn't really happen to guys. Uh, but uh, it has happened, but it's not very, it's demeaning. But anyways, um, so the same thing. You want to have that connection. You're giving treats to your dog. Your dog doesn't emotionally and cognitively uh, grow. Uh, the dogs, all the dogs, Minky, uh, Tonka, they don't, they didn't take treats. <laughs> Anybody who has a skittish or dangerous or extremely dangerous or even an aggressive dog and they're amped up, they won't take the treat because food treats do not exist as a communication device anywhere in the canine world. Nowhere. Not one behaviorist. Ian Dunbar, uh, Karen Pryor, um, uh, Temple Grandin, not one single celebrated behaviorist can ever say, yeah, food exists as a communication device and that's why we use it when we work with our dogs. So I'm just saying, let's change the world. Let's not, uh, what I have is a rare gift that I am sharing with everybody. It is really super simple and keep it simple. Uh, okay, so the next thing I'm talking about is hugs. I talked about hugs the other day. It's based on trust. So if you're not sure, go look at a couple of the article uh, episodes back. It's in, the, it's in the descriptions of what's being said. Sorry, I'm just rushing so I can get to the questions here. I feel bad for not answering people's questions. Um, so you'll see in the descriptions it'll talk about hugs and you can watch that part of it there's no timestamp on it so you're gonna have to find out on yourself because like I say it takes me two hours to three hours on the video sometimes 
Um, and But again, always make sure you reset your dog with a hug. It does a lot of things. It helps your dog balance out. And there's a certain way to hug your dog, actually. There's a certain way to hug your dog. Not the way you kind of think like that, where I've seen people like, oh, you mean like this? No, no. there's a certain way to hug your dog. And it's a trust issue. And it's a significantly brilliant way. Uh, it's very simple to develop trust trust with your dog if we do the coffee meetup you guys come and ask me and I'll, I'll let you know and so forth uh, we'll go from there the other part about doing a hug that resets your dog especially when they're reactive is it resets you right it resets us the human being because you're calming your dog down in the way a certain way of hugging them you're also calming yourself down because if, if I'm not calm when I'm resetting my dog or any of them he's going to feel it it's usually boy dogs that are pretty reactive because they are the ones that are supposed to be manly and etc. Thank you, Gina. That's so awesome. Thank you. Um, so, so again, when we reset our dog, we're resetting ourselves. We're creating the balance. Ever have an argument with somebody? You're both going at it, and then the the smart one actually says, "Stop for five seconds and let's just breathe and kind of regroup and just talk." What we do with our dog resetting resets us as well. Um, another point I want to bring up here is a safety issue. If you kennel your dog, or your dog is uh, just whatever in a day, and you're not, you got to supervise them if they're playing with other dogs, etc. If you kennel your dog in a crate, right? Take their collar off. Always, always take their collar off. I talked about that beforehand. Take their collar off um, because a lot of times what will happen, not a lot of times, but it has happened in the in the circumstances, and the person who's whose dog. Uh, this happens to ends up being you know what Mickey stop thank you all right so I, I acknowledge him that's it he stopped you, you can hear him growling um, what can happen is a caller while they're in the crate while you're gone they can it, it has happened and and you see it in the Facebook post every once in a while the caller gets caught on one of the great wires on the wiring and then the dog twists and twists and twists and then the caller chokes him to death suffocates him to death and it's a three minute death. So I'm being graphic on purpose. Your dog will suffocate to death in three minutes, right? That's how long it takes us to drown. I've drowned when I was a kid. It's extremely frightening. I still have a lot of trauma with it. I can't, I can't even swim properly. Take that collar off if you put it in the crib. doesn't matter if you think it's not a, that you're whatever. Oh, you know, it's a thin thing. It's not going to be an issue. It will still happen. It will... Uh, it will still happen. That collar can still twist because it becomes like a little thin twine a rope. You know, when you twist something, it becomes even stronger. Tensile strength becomes stronger. That's why you get wire and rope is always twisted. It can get caught in the wire, twist. The dog spins out of panic and they're panicking and they can't breathe and they choke to death. It's like having a heart attack and your dog dies a horrific death. Take the collar off. Same thing if they're out there playing on the patio and you have the slats in the, in, the, in the wood floor patio as well. I've seen posts where the dog actually got their thing, uh, their dog tag caught in the slat and almost died. And the owner was really lucky because he was able to cut the uh, the thing off. Just just by luck, he was able to. And it's horrible. The dog is just, it's, it's a horrible death. And again, it's the same thing like when a dog has a heart attack. And I've witnessed that uh, with one of my own dogs. And it's, uh, it's, it's traumatizing for the rest of your life to witness. It's very, very sad. Um, okay. Uh, I, I know that um, uh, uh, Deborah had asked me from uh, PB Adoptables, uh, Puerto Vallarta. I don't know how to pronounce it because I've never been there. Um, I'm kind of a homebody. So I, I don't really, you know, introvert. I don't like to go out to many places. So uh, she brings in dogs from Mexico. And uh, she had also mentioned, so I'll bring this up in another time, in regards to uh, adopting a new dog, new rescue dog that is dysfunctional. There's a difference between just a rescue dog to a dog that's dysfunctional, skittish, re reactive, whatever. Um, you know, and there was an article I talked about in one of my first po uh, broadcasts about, if, Minky, can you stop? Minky. Okay, thank you. All right, so he's right here now. Um, so what ends up happening is um, uh, I, lost, I lost track of what was going on because of Minky. Because uh, I, like I said, when I do it, I have to focus on what's going on. When I'm having, I'm telling them to stop. I'm I'm talking to Minky about it. Oh, okay. So she asked about dysfunctional dogs and uh, well, rescue dogs. And I talked about one of my first couple of episodes uh, about adopting a dog. And there was an article out there that said, you know, leave your dog alone for a week. And you have those trainers. Leave your dog alone for a week or two weeks. 
It creates an emotion of disenfranchisement. Your dog starts to tunnel into the, psych the, the, the basic psychosis of not understanding what's going on. There's abandonment issues, etc., that go on, insecurity, and helps to create a deep-seated position where that dog uh, will always have latent memories of that uh, relationship. It doesn't matter what happens, and the dog's not able to uh, involve. Minky, stop. Thank you. Um, okay, so there's that. So I'll do one on a dysfunctional aspect of it, and it's the same part of not abandoning your dog. You'll see it on my cover uh, video about Cody the Jindo. Uh, Cody's a Jindo who is coming, uh, who came to me. That one, well, I worked with him. Um, he was actually posted in a in a couple of uh, face local Facebook groups. What do I do? This dog, cat, blah blah blah. And because um, he's skittish, no one could touch him. He was biting the leash. He'd bite through cloth leashes and leashes that had chains on them. He would bite on the chain till he's bleeding. Minky! So then he just raised it up a bit. No need to scream and yell and high pitch it. Just the dad voice, the mom voice. Minky, stop. Not funny. Minky! Right? And I can't even see him. I'm actually looking. Yeah, I can't see him because he's behind the wall. Um. Seriously, Minky. Um, okay, so um, what was that? No, I forgot what I was doing. Minky's really um, looking for attention today. Um, okay, I, I I forgot about it. Oh yeah, about rescue dogs, etc. Uh, Jindo, uh, Cody, uh, formerly known as Alex, um, he's actually saved by Nami Kim herself with Save Korean Dogs. Nami Kim uh, saved uh, Alex from uh, a meat dog farm. And uh, there's a video that I have that's a trailer of it. And there's going to be, um, you know, there's a three and a half minute video. And then I'm going to probably put up the actual full uh, hour and a half video uh, of it. So that way people who do have skittish dogs can just see what I did. And they're going to be like, he didn't do anything. Exactly. Simple. Um, but you'll see that. And uh, Cody was not able, or Alex, like I said, is his former name, but I'll say Cody. Cody wasn't able to go outside. You know, couldn't be on the leash. He, he was. He completely shut down. He stayed on the corner of the couch in her living room. The foster's living room wouldn't move. Three years from Korea, he was stuck there. Couldn't have any growth. Then he went to L.A. Uh, at Nami Kim arranged in L.A. No help there. He couldn't get out as well. He, he was still stuck in the same dysfunction. Vancouver, same aspect of it. Uh, his foster is an amazing woman. It's just like the heart is really cool. And she's only interested in the dog's health and, and safety and all that stuff. She posted on there. And a few people had said, do this, do that, do this, do that. And, and, and you know, obviously it was not not, not work. Uh, there was a well-known uh, veterinarian, and one that I actually respect quite a lot. I think he's an awesome man, who said, you know, go see Dr. Claudia Richter or, you know, for that. And I was like, in my head, I'm like, no, you don't want to medicate a dog that's already dysfunctional. You put them into a fog, right? Someone slips a drug into your drink, same thing. Your dog has no idea what's going on. The predacious in nature that then t attempt to overpower and becomes a, a dysfunctional and balanced. <laughs> Minky, can you stop? Minky, come here. Thank you. All right, so there you go. Um, so then, a whole bunch of stuff, right? I'll, I'll talk about that. Like I said, as things evolve, you, as you guys follow the arc, you understand. You follow me on the simplicity of what I'm talking about and the radical uh, uh, descriptions, and then as you get on forward, then it becomes a bit more uh, mounted. Okay, Minky. No. No. Not funny. Minky, stop it. Okay. Um. All right. So we'll do that, and then uh, I talk about the dog crosses in front of you uh, when you're on leash. So I'll kind of do that leash thing about it as well. And then the dog wraps around your leg. So when the dog crosses in front of you, you know, people have said before it's prey drive, right? There, to a way, sometimes it is when the dog is somewhat uh, sanely, not insanely, but sanely balanced. Dogs crossing in front of you and so forth like that. That's an aspect of the, the dog's certain types of dysfunctions that the dog has. Um, so it's rooted in a psychological basis why the dog wanders in front of you. It's different reasons. You have a reactive dog, there's a certain reason. You have a dog that's skittish, there's another reason why they do that, right? Minky will cross in front of me, or else he'll bolt to the side because he's skittish. Same thing with other dogs. Um, there's that part. And the same thing with a dog wrapping around your leg. I saw somebody today with their dog. We had a session, obviously, and I identified the fact that her dog was wrapping around the leg due to anxiety issues, right? A bit more, uh, more, more, ex more of an explanation. More of an explanation. Minky, stop. Um, more of an explanation as to why her dog was wrapping around her. And then as we 
address the dysfunctions, and she was quite uh, quite impressed with what we were doing and the description, all stuff. And as we uh, addressed the dysfunction, he stopped going around behind her and wrapping around her all the time. And then he every once in a while, things uh, certain triggers would happen that we already identified, and then he would start doing it again. She catch him, and she like, and then eventually he, there's no issue. He was now not lo, no longer wrapping around her, nothing at all. Again, if we let our dog know why uh, and that we understand why they're having issues, and we can address it for them by resetting them and talking to them in their voice key, kaboom, dog understands that you understand them. They feel safer because we're making sure that we're keeping them safe. Same thing like say about walking, etc. Hi Anthony, hi silly boy, poor Anthony. Hi Anthony, see how big is how big he is, like that. Hi silly boy, hi silly boy. Okay, um, so um, then we're just gonna go to the members' questions. Okay, guys. Okay, I'm, stop. Okay, um, so I'm just gonna go to Mary's one, and then I might jump to. Uh, I guess I don't see Sarah's on it, so I'm just gonna wait. I'll probably do it tomorrow then, um, and then we'll do that. Uh, you know, what is that? Mine is high scent driven and often tries to cross sides. I've noticed when he's thinking it and I tell him other side and he passes behind me without tangling. That's Denver, right? Um, your dog is Denver, right? Because we were talking about that. Uh, you know, you, uh, Minky, seriously. Um, so it's not necessarily scent driven in that part of it, right? In actual fact, by watching the way you've read, uh, written that stuff down, Christine, and your cadence and the rhythm and so forth like that, the syntax of what you're drawing down, he's an above average dog. He's directional in what he's doing. He is a dog that communicates visually with you. And he also, and he also, he also maintains eye contact with you deliberately, not because you're asking him. He deliberately maintains eye contact with you. His eye contact is up to two seconds and then he stops and he goes away. Then he comes back and returns to you. So uh, just by reading what your words are saying, we're getting that whole aspect. And I don't know what your dog looks like. So, you know, you just picking that up just the way you write. Mary says, uh, the question is, Mary says, I have Great Danes for 26 years. My dogs are very smart. I talk to them in complete sentences. This is after this is from a different uh, episode that she did. So you can still anybody there can see the comments in, in, the, in my closed group. Uh, they know what I'm telling them. I'm not a social person due to the, uh, yeah, okay. I didn't, um, uh, her, her daughter passed away. So her dogs are part of her, her life. I didn't have a problem when I lived in the country since moving in a small town. I got another Dane puppy. His name is Kevin, which I love giving him a real name, a regular name, Kevin. I'm sorry for everybody who doesn't have that. Um, just you giving them a regular name. So that way it's kind of, plus uh, of course, you know, it's easier to say, Kevin, stop that. than you know. Boopsie, stop that. You're like, mm, okay, right, whatever, right? And, right, because you, right, anyways, okay. So, uh, Kevin, I started him on lead when he was small, but I learned of a dog that killed a puppy a street over from me. Uh, this uh, this uh, this dog got loose while I was out training Kevin, so I became very overprotective and kept him with me at all times. My backyard isn't big, so he didn't get the same training as my other dogs. I have another female, Dane, and let them out to play. But Kevin doesn't want to go out much. It's my fault. But now he hasn't seen other people or other dogs except my dogs. I don't know how he would react to other dogs uh, or people. Um, uh, I don't know how he would react. So how should I go about introducing him when I have no idea if he would bite them? I'm up in age uh, now, so I'm not as strong. Really, I like I like it with just my dogs and me, but our friend wants, uh, wants to come in. Should I just not take the chance? My female Dane is protective over me also. So the lady can come in and Bella, I guess it's her other Dane, uh, has not bitten, but she won't allow her to be close to me. Okay. Um, so there's a couple of questions there that are being asked of it. So I'll try to do that and then I'm going to, um, you know, go on to, to that part here. Um, okay. So I'm just going to go back and I'm going to break it sentence down by sentence. I've had great Dane... Seriously, Minky. Minky. Thank you. Um, I've had great days for 26 years. Minky. I've had great days for 26 years. My dogs are very smart. I take talk to them in complete sentences. So this communication, right? So there's a lot of reciprocal information that's going on back and forth with her, with Mary and her, her dogs. We're just, right, it doesn't matter, Danes, whatever. You know, somebody asks, you know, a certain breed, dog, etc. It, it, 
basic templates, right? Uh, okay, Sammy wants... I'm going to bring up Sammy. Come, Sammy. Hi, Sammy. <laughs> this is my little Sammy. Everybody say hi to Sammy. And this is Sammy. She's from Taiwan, so she doesn't have any legs. See, this is Sammy. This is my little Sammy. This is my little Sammy. So uh, I adopted her um, when I saw some uh, pictures of her on, a, on another rescue page. Hi, silly girl. Um, okay, so um, right, so I talked to them in complete, complete sentences. They know what I'm... I feel like I'm one of those, like, Dr. Evil with <laughs> the, the hairless cat. <laughs> anyway, all right. Um, uh, they know what I'm telling them. I'm not a social person due to the death of my daughter, so my dogs take after me. I don't have any problem with them when I lived in the country. And uh, swing into a small town, got another Dane puppy. Uh, or, okay, so, you know, she heard about another dog that had killed a puppy, so she became protective. And because of that, then she started secluding him, uh, secluding Kevin from socialization, right? So right off the bat, we already know that. And she admits it herself, right? She became overprotective and kept uh, kept him inside with me at all, like in with me at all times. My backyard isn't so big, so he didn't get the same training as my other dogs. So then we got a little bit of a difference in regards to how the other dogs are reacting because they have more size, they have more of a developmental aspect on a basis and obviously with play drive and prey drive uh, type of play, then they've been able to develop some logical process. So that means that Kevin himself is a little bit emotionally behind and, and uh, you know, a little bit emotionally behind from the other dogs so that part is a little bit of a tough thing so he's always so kevin's playing catch up in other words kevin's more i, I don't doubt that kevin's more rambunctious than the other two and he's much more you know like very assertive in his behavior on that part and then um okay so backer isn't big didn't get the same type of training got a female name right and she i think that's bella right that, that name that we have down there um and let them out to play but kevin doesn't want to go out much because Kevin, then it sounds like then, if that's the case, then you're keeping Kevin inside the home too much and you are somewhat secluding him, um, almost exiling him on a social basis. So that causes a sound. I'm not sure how old he is, though. Uh, all right, so it's my fault, but now he hasn't seen other people or other dogs except my dogs. I don't know how he would react to the other people and dogs. Uh, I don't know how to, re okay, I don't know how to react, so how should I go about introducing him? I mean, so so that's a difficult part to do, right? Because uh, it's, there's not a lot of description on the behavior that Kevin has uh, when he's outside. Ha like, has she taken him outside already? And in, in the in between time, once or twice, has she taken him out there? What is he like? What kind of collar does he have on again? If he's got a certain type of collar, it's going to affect him in a different way. His, 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 his behavior is going to be affected. So that one, the tough one. Um, uh, so again, I, I don't know how old he is. It's just a puppy, so mm, okay. Um, uh, so uh, you know, anywhere from four to seven months, I would probably guess. And if if that's the case here, um, okay. So I have another Dane puppy. Uh, sorry, another female Dane, which I'm assuming, like I said, is Bella, and let them out to play. But Kevin doesn't want to go out much. It's my fault. But now he hasn't seen other people. Okay. So I mean, how are you going to introduce him to other people and and dogs? And then she goes on another one. Really, I like it with just my dogs and. Me, so, you know, right, like me, I'm an introvert, so I stay home. But a friend wants to come in. So, oh, you got two now? Oh, so how old are they, Mary? So how old is Kevin and Bella? This is great. I'm, I'm glad you're online, actually. So I'll wait a little bit. I know timing and typing and all that stuff. Um, so, so it's going to depend on what kind of exposure you've had with them outside and how he is with people and when you walk to him how is he does he carry is he going all over the place does he start pulling on the lead really hard trying to get to them or is he just pulling moderately or is he respecting your your control your does he have leash manners is he is he um following you or whatever right you know there's a lot of variables in it that's why when i say to people um send me you know, concise, paragraphical descriptions of things, then it gives me better information, and it's in a chronological order sometimes, which helps create a structure of uh, development, which, you know, you go to my uh, rfarfbarkbark.com, it comes free help for your dog tab, and you'll see me reading people's things from their lengthy descriptions, like, you know, sometimes it's like 7 to 12 paragraphs, which actually was the one that uh, Sarah uh, was going to answer um, tonight, but I'll do it tomorrow. Anthony? 
Anthony. Anthony. Thank you. Um, you just talk to him like you would talk to anybody else, right? You know, like a kid. Um, okay, so it's, it's tough, right? So, you know, you want to have a friend to come in and visit, but should I not take the chance? Uh, my Dane, my female Dane is protective over me, but this lady can come into Bell, uh, come in and Bella has not bit her, but she won't allow her to be close to me. So, so you know, it's just that her insecurity of being around it, it is, of course, a little bit of jealousy, and dogs can process jealousy. It's a complex emotion on a rudimentary basis of the aspect of possession, uh, interdependency, codependency, um, uh, uh, confidence, level of confidence, self esteem. That when, when we're talking about a dog being jealous, it's the same thing like it is with a human being. All these little functions that we have as human beings, the dog has at a rudimentary basis. That's why you go to a dog park and you're petting your dog, Mary. Well, okay, if you were to bring him to a, a thing, um, you bring him to that and then the dog will see you petting another dog and your dog comes over to you and starts putting them in between you, right? It's, it's that. It's, it's, it's position in the home. Home is a level of confidence, all that kind of stuff, okay? So um, it all depends on the jealousy part of it, so when she's doing that. And it could just be her being unfamiliar and going, okay, why is this person with me? Right? Like, as in that lady, your friend, why is she there? Okay, so you say Bella is six years old, Kevin is two years old, okay? And they're both intact or neutered or spayed or, or you know, um, let me know. It has a little bit of a bearing, but not, in my case, it doesn't really matter to me. Um <laughs> Because you just deal with the behavior and you make adjustments for whatever the fluctuations and the dysfunctions are, blah, blah, blah. Um, so, you know, the, the one part then is you can go out for a walk with her, right? It's just, uh, I'd really like to see some of the interaction or a little bit more detailed description, uh, Mary, just so I have a context of what's going on. Because right now, um, the, a lot of generalities are going on here, so it's hard to do anything, right? I mean, there's a suggestion of going out for a walk with her, right? Everyone says that. It's a good advice that you get different trainers and behaviors go for a walk with your dog if you have two reactive dogs or you walk each other across the street and you kind of start to funnel yourself in narrowing yourself so when it comes to the to uh, bella um <laughs> seriously minky minky's grabbed the bone that's why will anthony anthony leave him alone thank you um so so it's got to be that part right so you can just kind of walk with him i gotta put sammy down i'm sorry she's 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 getting a little heavy Hey, there you go, Sam. Hey, go, Sammy. Um, you're okay, Sam. Uh, okay, so so again, you just go out for a walk with him and all that stuff. At the end of the day, you want to hold on to the leash as tight as possible. Because, uh, as you say, you're you're a little bit older and you're probably not as strong and heavy as a Dane, right? You know, they dig into three times their body weight when they want to get somewhere. So um, you want to make sure you have a strong hold on that leash. Um, if you have any mobility, balance issues, then you're going to have to make an adjustment instead of putting the uh, leash around your, uh, the loop around your wrist, you're going to have to hold it this way in your hand. So that way, if you do have to let go, you, you can let go as opposed to being dragged along and suffering some serious injuries. Uh, I, I know that, uh, um, Mike and Colleen had said that, uh, they're, uh, the ghost, all of the dogs, uh, Mike had, and Colleen told me about the fact that, you know, somebody they know, their friend had a Mastiff. Mass went for something or a big dog, I can't remember, and then just started bolting and she was in the park and she woke up like uh, one or two hours later uh, on the ground. So um, just you want to be careful safety-wise, Mary, uh, how you're holding the lead in that sense of it. But yeah, take him out for a walk and just judge it from there. Uh, yeah, just, just take him for a walk, go outside, see how he is, you know, how is one dog with with your friend and then try your other dog and again do it on seniority basis so i would assume bella you got first because kevin's a puppy so then you would deal with uh, bella first outside meeting friends and then you bring bella back inside then you bring kevin outside and kevin gets an intro Yahoo! get to meet this lady and see how he is and you want to have a hard grip and you know tell your friend and she doesn't have to kind of be too much over the board because you want to gauge what's going on with Bella's demeanor and same with Kevin's demeanor with the person. Um, yeah, because she's saying my female, you're saying my female Dane is protective over me also. So I'm not sure what type of protection she is like aside, you know, other than the friend is there and then she gets in the way and doesn't let, you know, but does she growl? Does she get upset? Right? So if you want, you can, like you said, put it a bit more detailed. Um, you can do that, right? And then we can go from there. 
so I have a bit more context. That's why I say when you see people who post things in these training dog training groups that I'm getting kicked out of all the time, people are asking two, three sentence questions. My dog did this, and then like, let's have context, right? Let's have more of that aspect. Let's have more of an understanding of what's going on with Bella and what her behavior her behavior is. And same with Kevin, right? By me asking the detailed, by you providing the detailed information, by me asking for by me reading it, it gives me context. It gives me the full description. You paint the story. You write the story, the, the non-fiction story of what's going on. And then we just extrapolate it. And it's the same thing, how I decipher it. Whatever you write down, I just pretend it's a human. Well, I don't pretend. I always keep it as, as a dog. But you as a human being can kind of bridge that sort of thing by just basically thinking, well, if this was a human child, what is the behavior? Anthony, thank you. Anthony is literally like this far away from Minky eating the bone. And so Minky knows I'm going to stop Anthony. So Minky has no problem about resource guarding because he knows I'm going to intercede when something happens. And Anthony's just waiting for it. And Anthony's just a puppy. So he's like, I want food. Hey, Matt. And then Anthony just wants food. And then, like, okay, we're addressing it. So we have this reactivity. We have a Minky the Jindo. And, uh, you know, he's, and there's Anthony. And, and these are dogs that have some significant interactions with each other before. Uh, yeah, I, I remember Matt. So uh, just let me get, uh, I'm just going to go through Mary's thing here. And then I'm going uh, um, and I'm probably going to go through Sue's question and maybe Maria's question. Oh, I don't know if I can, oh, I don't know if I can, well, let me just see if I, okay, Matt, uh, let me just figure it out here. It's just a second. I'm really sorry. Um, okay. So uh, with, with you, Mary. Uh, if you can give me a little bit more context of what's going on in that, uh, the Bella's behavior around somebody, uh, her background, and same thing with uh, Kevin's behavior, meeting people, etc., then I get more of a context of what's going on, right? And by understanding the context, then we have more of a visceral psychological understanding of what's going on with the dog. Like I said before, you know what? If I, like, I'm, I'm on, you know, dating apps and I'm looking at the photos of, 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 of a woman, if she doesn't have a photo, I'm just going to swipe left. Yeah, swipe left. If she has a photo and, I, and there's, there, there's somewhat of a, of a, of a, of a, uh, a emotional connection on that, right? I see something that's nice in that picture, then I'm going to actually, I always read profiles, right? Right? People say, right? So I actually read profiles. Of, of her and then I read that and I re read the way the rhythm is and all that stuff and I have an idea whether or not um, I have a connection and then I also have kind of an idea which I like as well and then which is probably why I'm single so um, you know uh, it's hard because I'm so high functioning sometimes and just and then when I meet somebody who's really quite intelligent and then because I'm organic they're not used to that and these are they're usually analytical and anyways Gotta have passion. Gotta have love, uh, right? So, um, so a bit more context, Mary. So I have an understanding of what's going on with Bella and with um, with uh, with uh, Kevin uh, and their behavior and stuff like that. So it's going to be best for you just to kind of rewrite it again. And more than happy to just post it back in my group, and then we'll go over it in the details. But again, interacting with Bella, take her out first. See your basis. She gets to meet your friend outside or inside. If you're gonna meet her inside, I wouldn't. Um, and also keep in mind that when you go back into the house with your friend, even though Bella may, you know, say Bella is awesome, she may still exhibit protective aspects around you. It's just going to be normal because, again, it's just what she's used to. It's like, okay, why are you here in our home, right? Why are you in your our home and why are you by my mom? And what do you want with my mom? So that also means that Bella, uh, thank you, Mary. That also means that Bella doesn't understand your role with her. So if she felt safe and comfortable around you, or at least looked up in the sense of you're maintaining authority with her, then she'd be like, okay, I'm listening to mom. So then that gives me the inference then that you are usually trying to tell her, hey, it's fine, don't worry about it. Why are you overreacting? But you're not actually talking to her in the sense where she's hearing you, and then she becomes protective. So that means that if she became protective and she was listening to you, you're doing correction on her, saying, you know, stop it. And then she goes, oh, okay, well, yeah, mom's got it now. I don't have to protect mom, and mom's going to still be here, and she is going to be firm enough with that stranger who might take you away from me. Right? Because there's placement in the position, 
not Stop. acquisition, it's familial aspect of it. There's aspects of interdependency, interdependency, codependency, self-esteem, self-confidence, self-worth, the, the dysfunctions, whether or not it's a modular or non-modular interdependency the dog has the processing aspect of the intelligence of the dog the emotional context of the dog you see what i mean we're i'm looking at dogs like they're sentient like a human being and we're creating that structure and we destructure the psychology downward and and so with mary on that end is more context we'll get that with kevin on his behavior in that sense of what he's doing ah minky 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 Minky, Minky, stop, Minky, silly boy. You're okay. Now he's come back to get to die. Stole his bone. See, they're 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 there. They're they're taking a bone, a raw beef bone, and Minky's like, okay. And now he's here. Hi, silly boy. Hi, silly boy. Minky, Minky. Are you hear the bone? Minky, really? Okay. All right. Um, okay, stop, guys, stop, right? And I, I've got my hand being between the two of them right now, which I'm always afraid because they might bite my hand instead when they go to they go to attack each other, nip at each other, and it's happened. Actually, it's only happened like twice. Uh, it does hurt, of course. Um, okay, so yeah, with Kevin, when you're introducing him to people outside, he depending on his behavior because he's been two years now with you he's been inside and I, I don't know when the last time you socialized him outside and took him out for a walk etc um so you want to be careful right because you know you don't want to become the crazy dane lady right <laughs> like i'm the crazy guy in the neighborhood everyone hates me because i have these danes and they're like oh great danes and then like oh they're not actually the nicest danes that we thought they were in what we read about and they're like okay we're not talking to him anymore. um so, you know, I still take him out to socialize. I just don't talk to people uh, because then the other thing is I got to pay attention to what I'm doing with, with whoever I'm walking with. Because, again, they're anywhere from 110 pounds to 160 plus pounds. And, um, you know, if I'm not paying attention to them, if I start looking at and talking to the neighbor, I'm distracted and they know. So Kevin will know if you're distracted as well. Well, not paying attention because you're the way you carry the lead. Just just the differences in the way you carry the lead, the dog can tell. Remember, I talked about one of the other uh, um, one of the other aspects of it. Um, uh, one of the other aspects of it, I said uh, how you walk the leash and paying attention to the weight of the leash, etc., etc. The dog's hypersensitive to everything. You got to make sure that you're maintaining that control. So if you do take him out for a walk, which again I would encourage you to take him out, maybe just to the front yard. And then you can bring him back in, you know, let the boy in the bubble out of the air airlock and let him have some socialization. Uh, otherwise, what's going to end up happening is you're going to create a codependency. Well, it's actually going to be an inter interdependency between Bella and, um, and Kevin. And it's going to be a difficult thing because then they're going to become, if you were ever to take them both out together, which I, by the sounds of you, you can't or you don't. Um, then you're going to create a reactionary behavior between the two of them, and then it's going to be a determination of which one is actually causing the issues and which one's insecure, and then you have a whole whack of issues going on after that, and it's going to be really difficult because then you're going to have one dog being coming reactive, the other one not, and or hiding behind you, and then you'll become uh, dealing with another, uh, both of them becoming both reactionary, uh, reactive, uh, uh, to, to certain stimulus and then they'll start becoming reactive to things that they ne never were reactive to because it's not trigger stacking which is a it's a silly comment there's no such thing as trigger stacking as I talked before in the previous uh, episode <laughs> they just find the accommodations of the events appropriate and their uh, their behavior is relevant to what they've learned as I said human beings are premeditated in our behavior dogs are consequential in our behavior Human beings, like I said, I uh, yesterday I said I have a session today. So last night I was thinking, well, what I got to do? I got to think about it a little bit. Not really, but I got to just figure out what time to leave the house, or to you know, if I have another session before, what time I have to go from here to here, uh, you know. And, and I'm I'm thinking about it, premeditated. The dog, our dog, they wake up and they're like, okay, I gotta go pee. I'm out peeing. Okay, where's food? That's it. There's just the, the stimulus, right? Because they're processing in uh, time through abstract memory. So in that sense of it, you know, like I said, as a slide, as a fr uh, slivers of, of time in the frame uh, aspects of it. <laughs> oh, Minky. Minky's going to throw up. I hope not. Oh, that's so gross. Right? We all hear that sound of the dog throwing. I'm like, oh, we got to clean up vomit now. Um, and it's usually with bones and...
garbage in it, right? Mm-hmm. It's, uh, um, okay, so uh, you want to just keep an eye on that part. The explore that he has is going to be tough. Uh, what I would suggest, Mary, if you're saying you're having some mobility issues or concerns, then I would suggest that um, if you can, have a friend walk, become familiar with one or both Danes and have your friends take out Bella and or Kevin together or separately, probably separately in the beginning, or hire a dog walker. Or, you know, some churches, some places will offer you a... Um, some churches will offer you, uh, you know, they'll, they'll do volunteers, right? You say, hey, I'm, you know, house, house, uh, housebound, whatever. Um, they understand. A lot of people in church will understand if you're housebound due to uh, whatever, mobility or, or uh, uh, emotional issues, whatever. And then they'll go, yeah, we have people who love walking dogs. But I, I would strongly encourage you to find socialization uh, for them, right? right? It, it's really, really important. Um yeah, so that's the thing. Uh, you know, Gina, actually, uh, one of the other episodes that I talk about, it's regards to being your dog's parent. Um, and one of the guys, um, John Pollock, had actually made a comment, uh, sent me a, a private message. He said I could talk about it publicly and all that stuff. And he, I always say, we're our dog's parents. Because when we look at our perspective as our dog's parents, then we have that much more of an embracing emotional context with our dog. We have the psychological context now because then we create a valuation. We create a individualization of our dog. That's why we give them names and all that stuff. And then it was interesting because I was reading John's thing. uh, 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 You're welcome, Mary. I was reading John's thing on it. And then he goes, said, you know, if you look at wolf packs, wolf packs have an alpha male and an alpha female. And I went, bang on. There you go. Mom and dad. A family. Mom and dad, bang on, alpha pack, mom and dad. So we take that part from what happens is we start to anthropomorphize our conjectures onto dogs as what they're supposed to be and what they're like. And then we think, well, you know, dogs don't have a familial aspect in the behavior. You know, Pavlov back then, dogs are dumb, drill holes into the dog's body and they die from starvation and all that stuff is what Pavlov did, right? Over 100,000 people attended his funeral for some crazy reason. Um, but, um, you know, and then we have operant conditioning by B.F. Skinner, who it's been debunked uh, in regards to trying to train anybody in the world with any type of stimulation and all that, which is then, then we have the four quadrants of operant conditioning, which is just banal because it has no basis whatsoever because it's just conjecture. It's never been able to prove and it's been debunked with human beings. And then we have from operant conditioning, which, uh, the AP. PDT Association of Professional Dog Trainers then creates a reliance on operant conditioning, which is then rhetorical back on that reliance onto Pavlov. And then Lima says the same silly things about this positive reinforcement and, and intermediate and terminal bridging and all that stuff, which they still don't understand. Because again, alpha pack, ma, a boy and a girl, alpha pack, male and a female, alpha pack, male, female, mom, dad, parents. Scientists are starting to talk about dogs no longer being pack animals, being, uh, you know, uh, familial, right? That's what we're talking about. And, and they're trying to understand. I've been talking about that for about three, four, well, four, three years uh, publicly now. It's the alpha pack is not it, right? So we talk about it as regards to family, and it goes back to just treating our dogs like children, two to three-year-old cognitive children, right? So that's the thing. Scientists are saying you know, alpha pack, etc. right? And I'm not ridiculing, I'm not making fun of you, it's just because you're not the only person, everyone says that to me. Um, and I was, especially in person, and I have to correct them, like, this is why it's not the case, blah, blah, blah. But, uh, you know, then scientists were saying, you know, alpha alpha male, alpha female, right, about the wolves and all that stuff, and that's the way the dogs are like that, canine species, the various genesis of the canine species, etc. And then they're like, okay, but you know what, dogs are like emotionally like two to three year old children, and cognitively like two to three year old children, which we all know that we love our dogs so we didn't need a scientist to tell us that so the scientists are saying that yeah, they're like emotionally like children okay then why don't we just extrapolate and put that little thread a little bit more and follow that thread to the point that okay so if you're talking alpha pack male and female and then you're saying that the 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 puppies are like are the dogs are like two to three year old children so then if we take the emotional context and then we up Grade it to the alpha male and female, then we have the dad and the mom. All right, so then we go from that point. That's where I've always gone from. And by going from that, then I understand the scale from dealing with extremely dangerous dogs downward and looking at that part. And when I've always treated all my dogs in that way, then, then we're okay with that. 
Um, okay, so there's that. Uh, you know, and when it comes to obedience and all that stuff, and you got some really awesome points here, Gina. Like I'm like really awesome points. Then it's just giving rules, right? So it is basic obedience, but then we put it in the context that is rules, household rules. Then we follow through, then we have more of a connection, then we have more of a personalized reason, emotional context, to then start working with our dog in a more visceral manner. And when we work with our dog in a more visceral manner, it means we understand them more. right? It, like I say, a lot of times people will put posts up and say, the dog, my dog, it, she, he. Uh, they swear at their dog, they look like, my stupid dog is today, and they'll like complain about it, and then there's no emotional co contact, uh, connection with it. And like yesterday I was saying, the last couple of times, you know, if you're if you're with your so Gina, right? So you're you're with your husband, and you're out there, and you're walking, and he sees a friend of his he hasn't seen in ten years, and you start, and he says, "Oh, I haven't seen this guy," and you start talking to him, and he's like talking, talking, and he doesn't introduce you at all, and he's still talking. And then a few minutes later, he walk, you you guys, oh, I gotta go, and you guys leave, and you walk up, and you say to your husband, "I have a name." How come you didn't introduce me? You know, and he, what did your husband say? Well, I forgot his name, so I, I was embarrassed. That's usually the reason, right? And I just usually go, so oh, I'm sorry, I forgot your name, right? And they go, oh, yeah, whatever. Um, so it's that con uh, it's that emotional context that we want to have. When we have the emotional context, then we're we're viscerally, mentally, emotionally invested and connected by having that connection. And when we think of ourselves as a mom or the dad, how would we treat a two or three year old child that was running to the toy store, right? That's like screaming, yelling. We treat them like they're our child, so we want to do that. Um, okay, so I'm going to bounce this. Uh, actually, I think uh, Christina asked me a question, so I'm just—I'm sorry, I'm bouncing this like crazy. Um, somebody asked me a question. Oh, Gina. Okay. Oh, Gina, you have a Great Dane. That's so awesome. Um, uh, when I walk my Great Dane, she's always on my. Oh, oops. Oh, I just kind of screwed up here. Uh, when I walk my great Dane, she's always on my right side. I never let her walk in front of me. And if I see her alerting and becoming on guard, I give uh, the sheesh command and get her attention back on me. It uh, works perfect every time. Um, so I do have an, uh, a blog that I talked about that, um, a few a few things beforehand. And uh, I'm just going to shift the way I'm talking right now. So I'm going to bring my tone down, and then it's going to bring down the tone of the pack here. Okay. So I'm going to start rounding my consonants and vowels on purpose. This can create a bit of a role of conversation, right? That voice key that we're doing on this end here. Um, so, you know, I actually have a, a thing, Gina, about um, dogs walking and so forth like that. And uh, I'll put the link in there if you want to take a look at it. It just talks about how to work with a dog on leash and so forth like that. And then you kind of get an idea of what's, um, what it is. Uh, on my perspective, that's all. Because, um, you know, that's just me. Um, okay. But uh, really awesome. I'm not. I'm being sincere when I say like these are great things to be brought up because a lot of people who do watch this will be thinking the same things that I'm thinking or the same things that you're thinking, and just giving you my perspective and with you know all all with respect in what I'm saying. So uh, just I don't not trying to be confrontational or whatever. Just you know just just in that part. Okay. So um, let me see here. Okay. Okay, so um, then the second question is asked by Sue: When your pet is possessed, oh, actually, it's kind of cool, right? So when your pet is possessed, when your pet is possessive of you, barks and brawls at others that get close to their owners. That's kind of funny because I was just talking about that in regards to jealousy, right, and, and all that. Um, there's not, it was just basically two words, or two sentences. When your pet is possessive of, of you, barks and brawls at others that get close to others. Uh, to their owners. Um, so that was actually, I think, from a post where I said, you know, what do you want me to talk about? And um, so the possession on that part is sometimes can be resource guarding depending on the behavior of your dog. If the dog comes up and is right there, depending where your dog's positioned. Sometimes if your dog is ahead of you, sometimes your dog's in front of you. You know what I mean? Like ahead of you, like 10 feet, or they're beside you. Oh, sorry. No, they're ahead of you 10 feet, or they're beside you, or they're leaning against you. It's aspects of codependency. It's aspects of insecurity. It's aspects of uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, lack of self confidence. Where am I in the position within the family itself? Like you know, when you have a family, I come from a family of eight, eight brothers and sisters. Like me, eight brothers and sisters, mom and dad. People say, so where are you in your family? Right, I'm number six. I'm eight. I'm number six. I know where I am in the family. 
And when I say I know I'm number six, I know that I have brother, a uh, sister, brother, sister, bro- actually, it's funny. I have four brothers and four sisters, well, three brothers and four sisters, and it goes girl, boy, girl, boy, girl, boy, girl, boy. So my parents were really, really talented because they, you know, they didn't have that. Anyways, right? So they knew they only had two positions. So, <laughs> and no TV in China. Um, so what ends up happening is I know where I am in my family already. I know I'm number six out of eight, which means one, two, three, four, and five in my family are ahead of me and they always get the best stuff. And then I, you know, then I'm down, down, down the list. But then I'm above seven and eight. So I'm like, woohoo, right? Even though number eight is actually my brother who's quite a successful lawyer back east. Um, so, but I still know that I'm older than him, right? And I, I know he's probably watching with, with my nephew. Um, hi, little Eric. So the thing is that, uh, Minky, you see, I get I get animated, dogs pick it up, right? We all know that. So it's not anything like, I should start rounding my consonants. But I know where I am in the pack. So if we're always communicating with our dog, we're always having conversations, we're always acknowledging them, we're always kind of reconnecting with them if they kind of seem out of sorts, then what ends up happening is our dog knows that we're always there for them. It's like that, you know, like I said, it's a codependency that we want to develop with our dog, a healthy codependency. What ends up happening is, sorry, i got to keep the timeline on here. Oh, wow, I'm like an hour and a half. Uh, we want to keep the codependency in a healthy aspect of it so that our dog knows that we're always connected. And actually, the, the dog that I saw yesterday, uh, I think it's five-month-old Husky, um, and, and um, the person, I, I haven't checked my messages, but she texted me today and she goes, He's so much calmer, and he's listening, and everyone in the dog park is saying he's actually more well-behaved than they've ever seen him. And just using simple techniques, the hug, the reset, the voice key, maintaining uh, contact with him so he knows everywhere. So that means if your dog is possessive of you, a Sue, if your dog runs off, whatever, and, and you, he sees another dog, if you're maintaining conversational contact with your dog, not, like, not screaming, like, Carlson, Carlson! He's like, Carlson, Carlson! So that your dog hears, there's no strain, no stress in the voice. I talked about this before in the voice key uh, episode of it. When you're talking to that in the communicative aspect with your dog, he hears it, then he goes, oh, okay, I've got to acknowledge I'm not so threatened with the other dog. Right? You know, the thing is, you know, it's okay to look at the menu, but you got to go home and eat, right? <laughs> so it's that part where we're keeping the main, ta- uh, we're maintaining that contact with our dog. He understands that we're still there, even if he sees another dog, and eventually that dog stops. Your dog stops to feel so threatened, feel less insecure. Uh, uh, the healthier level of codependence, instead of being an interdependent aspect, it has a stronger self-esteem as well. Yada yada yada, uh, and then you know barks and brawls and so forth that uh, that, and that's not necessarily a resource guarding aspect of you, but it is more pa- uh, an insecurity and a low self-esteem aspect of it when it happens. Depending on. The dog, depending on the functions, as I said, there's so many different psychological aspects of it that it's hard to get to uh, anything that makes sense. Um, okay, let me just see here. So you're on Twitter, uh, Matt. Matt, are you still there? Um, and I mean, you're back in New York, right? So it's got to be like one o'clock in the in the morning for you. Um, okay, so let me just. Uh, okay, there it is. So we just see that part. Um, keep an eye on YouTube channel. Uh, yes, don't shriek your dog. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So there we go. So uh, if you go to my Twitter page, uh, you guys, it, which is at arf arf bark bark. That's my Twitter uh, handle. Okay. Cool. Thanks, man. <laughs> so uh, what Matt says, uh, and he's posted a, a 25 second video of um, his dog Hoagie, a male Jindo mix, still young. Um, how old is he? He's 25 pounds. What is he, like four months, five months old? Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, must be mixed because he's only about 25 pounds I'll ask a question okay 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 so I'll watch him for a second so here what I'll do is um, okay let me just turn the sound on here so I'm gonna start from the beginning so I don't okay you can hear the sound okay so this is uh, anybody who's watching uh, my Twitter handle one half years oh wow he's uh, he's very juvenile looking like he's just got that well small body okay um, um, uh, arf arf bark bark is my Twitter handle and then you can go uh, uh, year and a half, and then you can go and just check out this video, and and follow Matt too, because Matt says ask Matt Chun, right? So Matt, now you're gonna have a bunch of people asking you questions now. Um, okay, so well, probably maybe not. I don't have a huge following yet, but um, there's, there's a thing. Okay, so we're just gonna play it here, and he's uh, the scene is starting off where uh, uh, Hoagie's laying on the ground. Hoagie, 
Okay, so he looks up and all that stuff. Right, so, okay, so I'm going to stop right there. Five seconds in, right off the bat, you can see that you've done a lot of trick training with him. You, he does a lot of tricks in that sense that he is following through with what you're doing. He's making eye contact with you. He is following things in that part, so that means that you've spent a lot of time. You've spent a lot of effort on making him make eye contact with you, too. And the interesting thing about it is you're a very patient person because the way uh, Hoagie is looking at you, so you're actually willing to spend time and wait for for him to look at you. So you're not necessarily a passive training aspect of it, but you're actually just paying attention to him like, okay, I know he sees me. I'm going to let him recognize it. And when he recognizes it, then I'm going to acknowledge him. So that's kind of, uh, that's what the hit that I'm getting off in regards to how you trained him, trained Hoagie. Okay, so I'm, and he now, right now he's looking right at, at the camera. So I'm just, let me start this. Uh, at five seconds in. You good? You good? So the interesting thing is, right, okay, so he's looking at you, looking at you, looking at you as, as he's talking to you. So he's waiting for you to uh, to give him input, right? So he's passively waiting there for input because he knows you're going to have a reciprocal response with him. And then when you, I just stopped it here at, uh, at 10 seconds and you put your right hand out. So he looked right to your hand. And if you notice the way he looked at your hand right off the bat there, he looked to see what was in your hand. So this is, an, uh, I would just say right off the bat, this would be an excellent opportunity for you to hand signal train him. And I have a pretty strong idea that we hand signal train him. Hey! Stop! Thank you. Uh, we hand... Stop! Right? So we just do that. And they, Minky, stop. Minky. Come, Minky. Right? There we go, right? That's it. That's why I said before. I, I got to be a predator too when I'm with my dogs. Not that I have to be alpha, I just got to be an eye on him because I have to step in. And if I have to physically step in, Minky, really, stop it, please. If I have to physically step in, I'm going to physically step in. And if I get hurt, I get hurt. There's nothing you can do. Uh, and it hurts like crazy. I, I've been bitten successively by... Uh, guys? Okay, not funny. Okay. All right. So, uh, um, okay. So, um, I, I, what I would say, Matt, is that... Um, He's really good at, he would be, uh, Hoagie, sorry, my fault. See, there's, there's me disenfranchising emotionally. Hoagie would be really good to, if you taught him hand signals. This is a dog that you could actually take to a, um, uh, you know, I, I don't want to make everyone else feel bad, but you could probably take him into competitions uh, for hand signals and, and following so, so forth like that because you see the cognitive process and you see his eyes are set the way he is setting and see how he is not. Moving jerkily around. Oh, sorry, because uh, it's reverse here. So he's not moving jerkily around to you to watch you. He's actually tracking you at his speed. So there's that little bit of that brilliance of his intelligence of, of, of comprehension there. Okay, so we're 10 seconds. Ooh, oops, we're 10 seconds in. Okay, so I'm going to play it now. Cool. All right. Okay, so you start licking your fingers. We're at 13 seconds. So you just start licking your fingers. I wish I could screen share. I just don't know how to do it. I wish I could. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I just don't know how to do it. Um, okay, no, no, no worries, Matt. Just hang a sec. Okay, so you saw that you put your hand out, your right hand out, and then you started to look at it, right? Or like I say, you started to see what was in there. So that's the treat motivation aspect of it. Sometimes that, that that's a part of you, and you're very still in that sense of it. And then he goes to see, okay, there's nothing there, so he smells your fingers, right? Hoagie smelling your fingers to see whether or not there was a treat there. And that's why I say the dogs have an ability to cognitively process uh, their, 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 their targets, their, their treats, right? They know how to put valuation to it, right? Some dogs have a favorite treat that you can give them this, and they're like, whatever. And then you give them something else, like, oh, I love it. And then you could have them both together, and they do that. There's an aspect of being able to equally feed your dogs uh, with different treats as well. A whole bunch of stuff. It's just brilliant. Um, same thing when you feed a dog and, they, and you drop... Uh, a piece of food or you don't bring anyways a lot of stuff uh, okay so he just went to look uh, your finger there okay stop right there at 14 seconds you saw that he put his face away from you he looked down to the ground which is just brilliant because he wanted to see if something fell on the ground right and that's dogs natural behavior they all do that the smart dogs do right food motivated in that aspect but if you see that part what happened to him at 13 or uh, 14 seconds his right eye blinked slightly, right? So I'll tell you that uh, we can PM privately and I'll tell you what that means. Um, but it's really interesting. His right eye blinked by itself. So it's very cool. And it indicates 
a certain processing that the dog is doing. And it's why I said that he would be good at hand signals and that you spend a lot of time with him and you're very, uh, you're mostly patient with him and you always work on his schedule, so to speak. And then, okay, so then you just put his paw on your hand, right? So the motivation is right, could you give him a thing? Good okay. boy, good boy. Good. Right? So you see that? So you went, good boy, we're at 20 seconds, and you went, good boy, and then a couple of times you held his hand, kind of it was wavering a little bit as he held it, it was wavering a bit, and then he went to take it off, and then he, and then Hoagie stopped, and he put his hand back on. <laughs> Cognitive processing. Problem solved right there. Hoagie reasoned just there. Do you see how gorgeous that is? I, I get this excitement about it because that's how intelligent he is. Stop it. Really? Thank you. Uh, you see that? He reasoned. He processed cognitively through. Is that not brilliant? Absolutely brilliant. Okay, so I'm going to start from 20 seconds. Boy. Good boy. Right eye blinked again. Right eye blinked again. We're at 22 seconds. So at 21 and a half seconds, his right eye blinked again. All right. See, that's how fast I'm processing this video. I'm watching this in real time. I'm processing it this fast. I'm paying attention to everything that's going on this fast. The right eye blinked twice. I love this stuff. I get super passionate about this. That's why I love video. I love seeing this stuff. Uh, uh, oh, that part, you know, I can answer that next time because I'm like an hour and a half, hour and 40 minutes in. Um, Gina, I'm really sorry. But I love the questions you're asking because the questions you're asking are the questions that everybody asks and then they get the, the silly answers from the top of the food chain. Um, okay, so with Hoagie, his eye blinked two different times and it's only his right eye. It means something. Like I said, we can have a discussion privately about this and we'll have a bit of an in indicative aspect of it. There's no charge for it because when I do this pro bono stuff, like I say, I ask for donations, etc. But I'm. this is why I'm leaving a legacy. So that way, people 50 years from now, they're going to watch this. They're going to go see. Your tweet, right? You know, hopefully you're going to be around in 50 years because I know I'm I'm not going to be because I'm not that young. Um, and then they're going to see this and they go, there it goes. To see the right eye blink. And then you'll be like, yeah, I know why now. But that's why I said to you, he has a level of intelligence and the way he is able to problem solve. Not problem solve, the way he is able to structure. Reason. Okay, so 22 seconds onward, we're going to go. He's looking to his right uh, uh, screen left. So to his right hand side. Okay, hang on a sec here. So he sits, blinks again. Right eye blinked again. Left eye sort of, uh, we're at 25 seconds. His left eye blinked a little bit, right? So what that means is the right eye is, is, a, is a certain thing about it, and then the left eye happened because of a default, a default of cognitive processing. Do you see how, like, we're, I'm 25 seconds in, and I see the brilliance of your dog already. Just bring, like even in the first few seconds, I said the eyes, his eyes, the way he tracks, right? It's it's deliberate. It's it's not quick. Like in dog speed, it's not quick. It was deliberate tracking in the first bit of it. Okay, so 25 seconds in. Up, up. Right? So he went up, he jumped up there, and now he's back on the ground at 27 seconds in. And do you see that on his when when he went up? You didn't have a treat for him. He looked for the treat because he dropped his head down slightly peripherally to see where the treat was. So that's twice that he checked for the treat. The first time when you put your hand out and he looked on the ground. The second time he did it as well. So that's why I'm saying you spend a lot of time with him doing the tricks over and over again, right? All that kind of stuff. Do you see what I mean? It's routine in that part of behavior for him. But that connection is because of it's more of a visceral connection with him. Okay, so 27 seconds in. You guys are seeing this amazing thing. Like you, when you watch this video, you're gonna see it. You're gonna be like, "Oh my gosh, this is freaking awesome!" About Hoagie. Right? That, like I said, when I, when I work with a dog, I fall in love with them. Okay, so 27 seconds on. Yeah, the motivation it's okay. You know, you don't have to worry about. It. Like I said, you'll be able to get him to if you start transitioning Hoagie into hand signals. And then you make an adjustment by instead of substituting treats instead by using a physical touch. Uh, one of my vlogs talks about physical touch and how to do so. Uh, I should do one about um, finding the dog's joy spot. 
which is that part on the dog's body where they like to be touched. Same thing like human beings. Some people like their hand held. Some people like their arms around each other, blah, 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 right? So it's personal preference, and there's that part. So 27 seconds in. Uh, uh, Gina, um, it's not that... It's, you know, I've worked with predatorial dogs. I've had dogs that are up to my chest, just stand, like, on all four. They're that big, and they have tried to stalk me, and, and I... It's really like having a wolf, a lion, a serial killer, and and they just walk at you. They don't chase you inside the house, my my place that I'm renting. They don't chase you. They walk because they already know all the exits. They already know the corners. They already know my strategy from previous behavior. I've had them where they're literally as, as close as this camera, which is about uh, two and a half feet from me, oh, two feet away from me. Where they're that close to me. And they just... They look at me. Waiting. And if I move... They move. It's it's like... If I, I'm it, They move their whole body. You have no idea how it feels. Um, but we can all do this. We all have it in us. It's intuitive. It's instinctual. It's developed inside of us over generations. Over millennia. Over evolution. And that's... Yes, I believe in God, but I also believe the process of evolution as well in the behavior, iso emotional isomorphism, etc. But what ends up happening is our instinct that we developed over a, a gazillion years from when we were Neanderthals, troglodytes, etc. That's our intuition. That's our gut that we swallowed because we couldn't show it in front of the rest of the world. That's why everything's free. Got to share what I'm doing because it's not me. It's for the dog. Okay, so we're 27 seconds in. You know, Like I said, don't show me anything shiny, Matt. All right, so 27 seconds in. So we're going to go into X in this part here. Just a second. So I just got to... Everyone's got... Okay, good. Okay, you see that part there? So as you brought your hand down, he looked to his left-hand side and he went to avoid your hand because he knew you were going to pet him. So he already knows your routine with his your behavior with him. He already knows because he went to avoid it. Because what he said was, so waiting for that treat. So then what you've done is you've stacked tricks with him. And not only have you stacked tricks with him, you've deliberately randomized the stacking of those tricks with him on purpose. Which made him a much more smarter dog in reasoning. I say to people, go to YouTube, Google uh, YouTube videos of dogs that are two, three years of age. I mean, not dogs, I mean Humans uh, who have those videos like, you know, how to how to play uh, intellectual games with your child. I mean, your human child, uh, two, three-year-old children, four-year-old children. What, whatever video that you like that speaks to you inside that you think, oh, this is kind of cool way to teach a child. And then adapt it to your dog. You are going to have a brilliant dog. And that's why I also think emotionally we can actually evolve our dogs over generations, maybe 15, 20, 40 generations of dogs where they're actually having a higher level of reasoning skill. Right? Not of the apes, planet of the dogs, but we can do that. So that part, you again, we see him starting to avoid and all that stuff and he stays solid. They're waiting for you. Okay, so 29 seconds and then we have a 30 second. In one. Right? Then he comes into you for a hug. Right? Because what ended up happening is he was like, okay, uh, I didn't get a treat. Uh, I'm just going to come over to you now because I'm not. When what he actually did is passive aggressive. Well, it's not passive aggressive. What he basically said to you, Matt, he said, Dad, I'm tired of you doing. I, I'm, I'm tired of you playing games with me. Okay. So what's the question Matt says? Uh, let me just get some water here too as well because uh, I've been talking for. Uh, um... Okay. All right. The issue. He often doesn't listen. Thank you, Gina. Um, you know, like I say, uh, please share my work. Please follow me on YouTube. The more people that see this and they see posts like this and they're following my work, the more the trainers and behaviors. And I have some that are very private. And they, you know, if you look at the subscribers that I have, there's a lot of fake accounts that have zero on them because these guys can't publicly associate with the uh, 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 heretic. Like me, right? I'm, her I'm a her heretical, right? They can't associate with somebody like me that's not that because 
they have guide of ethics and all this other garbage, but they're following me and they tell me and I'm like, no, I don't care, whatever. And then they sometimes they publicly criticize me because they think they're, you know, uh, whatever. And they apologize and I, I get it to a point, it's kind of hurtful, but whatever. Okay, uh, so Matt says, he often doesn't listen to me. He often will not come when I call his name at home or outside. When outside on leash, he doesn't even look up at me when I try to get his attention unless he knows I have a treat. All right, I, I read that Jindos have a mind of their own, but every dog does. Um, they're very independent. Not independent, they're, they're just not used to be socialized and not used to a codependency aspect. So he's got a, a, somewhat of a low codependency because he kind of acts a little bit like a toy in his behavior because he's reasoning. He's like, yeah, this human's just dumb. That's why he doesn't listen to you. Not that he doesn't... Seriously, guys. It's not that Hoagie doesn't have... Minky, 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 Minky. Okay, Minky. Thank you, Minky. Right? We just talked him down. Another fight about to happen. Um, so he, he, it's not that he doesn't have any respect for you, Matt. It's that you haven't shown him respect. Right? Think about it. Think about the way you've been working with him. Think about the way you've been treating him. Think of the way that when you talk to him, you've been begging him to listen to you. The repetitiveness of your conversation with him is causing him to feel that you don't have respect for him, so he doesn't have respect for you. Right? Because you look at the uh, the mom dad of the wolf pack, the alpha male female, right? The wolf, that mom dad. How do they maintain respect? Yes, it's physical, it's reactive, it's aggressive, but at the same time, even just a simple like you know, a bark, the dog stops. Tell Minky when he's growling. Tell him to stop, Minky. Right? And then he stops. Hi, Minky, come here, please. Right? See, I'm talking to him. Like, even for earlier when I got distracted and I forgot my train of thought, I'm paying attention to Minky. My attention is 100%. Just like your cell phone at, 90% on the dog. That's how you don't fall. Right? When you're on your cell phone, you're looking, you're texting, you're, walking, you're walking down the street, and you're in New York, so you know you got to pay attention to everything. But how is it that you don't fall into traffic and you don't run into a building sideways? How do you know to go from A to B straight line? So pay attention to your dog emotionally, respectfully, in the same manner. I've always said to people that we are the apex predator. Six million dogs have been killed in North America. So what ends up happening is the behaviorists and the animal uh, scientists and all that stuff, what do they say when a dog can't be, quote unquote, fixed, kill? Dog can't be fixed, kill the dog. I prove them wrong with every single other dog with and you're in New York go contact the Southampton Animal Shelter about Tonka they know me so what ends up happening is as an apex predator we look at dogs as disposable if we don't have respect for something that we can easily kill how many times have you heard somebody go yeah my dog's da 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 I'm gonna have to put him down where do we get that kind of callousness and superficiality it's because the industry has taught us that if the dog can't be fixed, the dog can't be fixed till the dog is broken. Like a cell phone, we kill the dog and that's it. The industry has taught us that because they don't understand the psychological aspects. I just proved to you here, uh, this is 30 seconds, and I, and I give you everything about your dog. I really know how to deal with it. Okay, I read that Jindos have a mind of their own. Uh, a couple broadcasts ago, somebody's talking about the Staffordshire, uh, the same thing. There, there's a key template of personality that everybody has. Human beings, we have a key, right? eight different personalities. We got the dark triads and blah, 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 personalities, etc. We all have certain templates of personality. I call it the dog behaving by developing a fear template as they grow and they develop things like, okay, put in this piece here, put in this piece here. So what ends up happening on, on Hoagie's side of things he has a personality, and yeah, he has some stereotype things, right? You know, like Asians can't, uh, you know, uh, we're really, you know, I'm not, I did it all the time. It's an old joke now, right? <laughs> but that's the aspect of it. So they do, yeah, have a mind of their own, but we have to respect their processing speed and their ability. They process it one tenth of a second. Articles, uh, episodes, I talk about it, so I don't want to repeat on that because I'm running like two hours now. Um, okay, uh, so do I accept that he's just going to have his own mind and do I continue to train him to respond to me using the usual techniques for non-jindo dogs? Okay, so uh, let me just bring this back down here. Oh, sorry, hang on a sec here. Let me keep uh, blocking out here. What you want to do, Matt? Is wait. That's it. See how I kind of didn't say anything? You kind of waited for me? Kind of waited for me? 
kind of waited for me. I, and I talked like a million miles. I'd be perfect in New York the way I talk. I talked a million miles. But what did I do? I waited. And what were you doing? You're like, dude, hurry the F up. Talk. So just wait. So when you're talking to him, when you make eye contact with him, you're just going to give him a command. But use his name. So you're going to say something, for example, if you want him to uh, S-I-T, right? Because I'm not going to say it here. Um, if you want to do it, you, uh, you're just going to say, Hoagie sit. And then you're just going to watch him. And then when he sits down, because what happens is he's going to go, okay, I heard that before. But what you've done in the passage is you've tried to convince him to sit by asking him to sit more than once. So just give him some time to reason through and watch him. And when you see his back haunches start to kind of get a little bit uncomfortable, right? It's not uncomfortable. He has gone through his head reasoning like, is that what he means? But I'm used to my dad telling me this 17 times and, and trying to get me to do it and trying to coerce me into do it, trying to change my the way he talks to get me to do it because he doesn't think it's working. So then we confused him, right? You confused Hoagie like, okay, what do I say? What do I say? Uh, right? Dad's doing this. What do I, what do I, right? So again, just slow down a bit when you're having conversation with him and then just talk to him right and so you said yeah uh, so i was right yeah <laughs> okay so just slow down make him wait for you savor it you know like that that incredible dessert that like you know like i used to eat meat and one of my favorite uh home cooked meals when i went home and it was a very bland meal and i know like i said i don't eat meat anymore it's been a number of years um but beef tongue Right? I know you guys are like, oh, beef tongue, Asian guy, right? Oh, whatever, right? Okay. But the way my mom made it, she would just literally either boil it with some spices and it was really quite bland, or she would just cook it with ginger and uh, oyster sauce. I know, I'm making you hungry, right? And then, and then it would just be put on plain white rice. And no soy sauce, Matt. No soy sauce. You know all you, all you white blonde girls? No soy sauce. Um, and that would be it. I'd go home and be like, okay, mom, did you make it? And if she didn't make it, I'd be like, what the heck? You didn't make it, right? And I'd have a temper tantrum because I was a child. I was immature, an immature adult. So you just want to kind of connect with them. You, you, you know what I mean? You just, uh, sorry, I just kind of went off on this because I got hungry now. I haven't eaten all day again. Well, I ate a little bit. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, Gina, watch some of these videos that I have on my YouTube channel. Uh, all these I'm working with and same with you Matt under the hey dog or the animal hope and wellness foundation <laughs> um, all these dogs I, I work with them without treats I've worked with dogs where the top behaviors uh, uh, dr. Rebecca Ledger has referred to dogs that should be killed because she said they couldn't help and she writes and consults with the state and provinces and cities and regions on animal welfare and laws and all that stuff I, no treats no medication all that kind of stuff. So it's that part of it too, right? So the so just when you look at him, before you even say anything, make eye contact with Hoagie and he's going to watch you. And then you say the command in a slower tone of voice. Then he has to listen to you. And when he does it, you're going to praise him as if he went potty outside. As if he went poo in the backyard. Good boy, Hoagie. Use his name always. I was saying earlier about the apex predator. Killing dogs. Because we can just... What do you do? You take the dog, put him on a pole, you bring him in. It's the reason why we don't have chimpanzees. Because we can't catch a chimpanzee. Because the chimpanzee is a billion times stronger. Ten million times stronger than us. And would rip our heads off as we've seen in the news in the past. That's why chimpanzees aren't our domestic pet. But dogs are because they have similar emotions but because at the end of the day as a human being we have the power to kill them without a second thought so if we saw dogs like like we see dogs like as if they're ants so we have no problem stepping on an ant right we walking down the street step on an ant whatever same thing with a dog. Six million dogs are killed. But say, for example, that ant was the same size as a human being. We would be running away. We would be hiding. And then we'd all get together and go, okay, 
well, we can't kill these ants because there's a trillion of them. We have to learn how to work with them. How do you work with something that you fear? You create respect first. And then, you okay, there we go. All right, so that's the thing. All right, so there we go. Uh, I think, it's, I believe I'm just like, I think uh, Hook does a lot of thinking. I can sense it too, yeah. Right, so that's a connection, right? The, that's a simpatico that's between you. And I call this, right, they say, why, uh, Matt, why, why, how, you know, how does, how do humans and, and dogs cohabitate so effectively, etc.? And they've done it for over 10,000 years. And I say, those scientists are idiots. Because if you take the cohabitation, it only applies to the to domesticated dogs, only to domesticated dogs living with humans. Because what happens is when you take that domesticated dog and you put them, in, you know, those losers that abandon their dogs into the wild, right, into the woods, the dog loses that domestication. And then when that dog mates with another domesticated, formerly domesticated dog in the wild, like in, you know, certain, like, uh, reserves and, and northern areas and, and remote areas, right? The dogs are all wild and all that. After three generations, most of the genetic understanding of domestication is gone from that breeding. The, that domesticated doesn't, doesn't, the dog doesn't know anymore. If you were to take a stray dog that lived in the wild two generations, three generations in and bring him home, he won't have any understanding of cohabitation with you. Bring the meat dogs, right? Jindos, right? Shiba Inus uh, in Korea, right? Bring a meat dog. I have the meat dogs here. They don't have the domestication understanding of it. We teach them through codependency aspects. See? Codependency comes all around. Codependency aspect of it. And then our intuition, right? The psychic aspect, it's our intuition, Matt. So, the cohabitation 10,000 years ago, I call it emotional isomorphism. Two different genetic structures, but emotionally, we paralleled each other. That's why you have such a bond. But then, at the end of the day, we have ultimate power and control over them. That's why we kill the, our dogs. So it's not really the cohabitation. It's not a fair cohabitation. And the scientists don't know what they're talking about because they're only dealing with 60% of the reactive dogs out there. The other 40% are killed. Because they don't know what to do. If the scientists knew what to do, 100% of the dogs would be saved. 100%. I deal with the top 5, 10% of dogs, the predators. You, you see newspaper articles, etc., etc. I have 100% success across the entire board. I just read your dog in 30 seconds. You have intuition, man. We all, that's why I said we all have intuition. Trust what you believe in and go over there. Follow your gut. I think that you already knew about the timing that you were doing with Matt. I suspect you already knew that you were just kind of missing something. And I suspect that you were about two beats ahead of him. You were actually two beats behind him. Right? Right? There you go, man. You weren't too ahead, you're too behind him. Dog reacts in one tenth of a second. Bruce Lee could kick three times in a second, punch five times in a second, test it in Seattle Science Center to see a light, press a button. That was it, cognitive processing. Two tenths of a second is how fast Bruce Lee was. Your dog, when you take Hoagie to a dog park and you're holding him on a leash, and he's ready to go, and he's ready to go, and he's ready to go. And you, the instant you let go of the leash, even before it's touched the ground, he's already off. He's already running. He's taking that physical input, cognitive processing, and physically manifesting it by running. He's waiting for it. How many times have you been waiting to do something, and, and you're still too slow to, you know, someone's like, you know, you catch this, uh, this black visa, and if you catch it, it's yours, right? You can spend whatever you want on it, you know, black visa. I mean, that's a house right there. And they drop it, you can never catch it. You take a treat. And your dog is here and you drop it, your dog gets every single time. Your dog's processing at a tenth of a second. Bruce Lee reacted at two tenths of a second. Major League players process at 0.25 of a second. Bruce Lee processed at two tenths of a second. Your dog is twice as fast as Bruce Lee. Imagine if we were all as fast as Bruce Lee. What would we say about Bruce Lee? He's an average guy. Scale, right? 
economy scale. That's what it is there. The dogs are processing Gina at a tenth of a second. That's why there's no such thing. And I've always said it. And all these behaviors, the dog's unpredictable. All these trainers, the dog's unpredictable. Dog's not unpredictable. Human beings, we react three tenths to eight tenths of a second on average. So we're three to eight times slower than our dog already. They're not unpredictable. We're too slow. See, all this stuff, we put the respect, that's what I talk about, we put the respect, we follow our intuition. We have this ability to understand. In 30 seconds, I caught everything. Watch the video again, see how he blinks twice on his right side, and then the third time, he blinks in with a default to the left side of his eye. There's a reason for that. Even before I saw that, I told you he was reasoning. There's a behavior aspect of it. It's a dog that, hoagie here, that you can train with hand signals and because as I said you randomize things on purpose reasoning skills developed there as well he had the reasoning skills to begin with you blossomed it for him so now you just have to round it off by creating an emotional context with him without being too urgent with your behavior with him you weren't two steps ahead of him you were two steps behind him at all times and you didn't realize it so uh, that part, so again, when you go to give them a command, make the eye contact, wait a bit, an uncomfortable length of time for you is actually a reasonable time for Hoagie. And then you give them the command in a different tone of voice, slower, and you watch him, and you'll see him start to kind of fidget a little bit. Reasoning. Brilliance of dogs. Absolute brilliance of dogs. Uh, I think I'm almost at two hours now. I gotta eat. Dogs haven't eaten at all, and they're gonna be pissed off. Um, and I and I was running a little bit behind today. I was just doing a whole bunch of stuff today uh, for a group and for people and all that stuff. Um, if you like what I'm doing, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Please share my work. Uh, I've just shown everybody here live uh, process. I don't know Matt. You know the usual disclaimer and all stuff. He just tweeted me earlier today about it. Um, and, and sorry, let me just see what's going on here. Oh, Matt, you're very welcome. You know, uh, th this is what we're supposed to do, right? You know, pay it forward, right? Um, but, you know, uh, hi, Rita. <laughs> yeah, we're going to, I'm going to do, you know, tomorrow I'll do one. Friday, Saturday, I have a group session uh, for reactive dogs, actually. And it's so, it's so funny because everyone says, you know, my dog's really reactive, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, no, your dog's not. Like, because my scale is 10. The predators are 10. The dogs that they say bite level 6 is my V6 scale. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, man. It, you know what? If you want to do some videos? We can commercialize this. Like I say, it, it, trust me. You, you just saw what happened in, in real life. Um, oh, real time. Whatever, right? I mean, we could have a podcast. I, I was talking about the other day about doing a podcast because you can imagine... It, Imagine just ran, random people phoning up our 1-800 number or whatever, and we're doing a podcast on this. Boom, boom, boom. We can change the world for dogs. We can prevent 6 million dogs from being killed. That's my goal, to change the world for dogs so that it recognizes functional sentient beings. But yeah, anyways, we can talk about this, Matt, in regards to um, Hoagie's behavior and what that eye thing doing and so forth. It's a bit more... Uh, uh, psychologically profound um and, and if i talk about then it, it's going to confuse everything and then everyone's going to it's going to be obfuscated and then you'll be like what is he talking about uh but we can jump on the phone as well i like and it's not whatever not because of what you offered or anything like that i i do it for people i do it uh, i do pro bono for almost three dozen uh, rescue organizations local and international rescue organizations uh, get on the phone all that stuff yeah, I don't know any of that stuff. I don't, I don't know any of that stuff. But you know what? If we can market it and then we can donate, uh, you know, I would donate a portion of what I do back into the uh, into helping dogs and, and all that stuff. Like I say, I got a, a donation and all that stuff. Thank you, Matt. I have a donation, uh, GoFundMe and Patreon. And, you know, once I hit $250, then we're going to, I'm going to give away uh, you guys, the donors, Christine and all that stuff. Uh, we're going to do a free session for somebody on a fixed income. I'm not here to look at making money because I'm just, I'm really 
simple guy, really straightforward guy, rent an old ugly house. You know, it's not even mine. It's got mice in here and all that stuff. Um, I just want to leave a legacy, a digital legacy, right? So, uh, but you know, if we can get the word out, that's more important because again, each dog's life that's saved is profoundly important because to each of us, it's important. Like when you, Matt, said, um, you know, it's probably just a silly question. It isn't. It meant something to you and it was important to you to ask, which means it's important to me. The thing is, you realize now there was just a little bit of a visceral uh, disconnect. That two, two, you know what I mean? Like the two, four, two, anyways, whatever, right? So so that's all. Um, but again, uh, everybody, please share um, my work. I'm not 5%. My, my, I started at 100%, so that's why this is the longest one, like two and a half hours now. Um, uh, please share my work. Uh, if you have any questions, put it in the comments. I can't answer them all, but I will look through them all. As I said, and I'll put them in the next ones, whichever is somewhat generic uh, for the rest of it. Gina, same thing on that end. The questions that you ask. Uh, if we can help change the world for dogs, we're going to change it. And uh, again, I just proved this in real life that we can do that just by looking at the videos and understanding the dog's behavior. It comes from somewhere and it comes from our soul. Right? It's humanity. Let's take care of each other. And some later, our dogs are the biggest incredible bond. Let's just pay it forward. Like I said, if you're talking to someone on the phone that you don't that starts complaining about stuff, spend an extra 10 seconds and listen to them. And then you say, okay, well, we spent, you know, we just let, can we just change the topic, please? And that's it. And just shift over. And so if you don't want to, then say, well, I, you know, I just could we please do so? If not, then you just go goodbye, <laughs> right? You got to also put your foot down too, right? Because a lot of people are a lot of people are like emotional vampires. Um, everybody take care. Thank you so much. I will have this uploaded since it's two and a half hours. It's probably, I'm probably going to be up to like four or 5 a.m. in the morning trying to uh, translate all the key points and everything like that. Um, if you have any questions, put it in the comments. Uh, please uh, like my page. Please share my page. Please follow me on Facebook. Please follow me on Twitter. Please follow me on Instagram. Uh, by doing so, you help get my word out. Uh, if it wasn't for me doing this on Twitter, then Matt wouldn't have contact me same with you Gina I'm not sure how you found out about me but this is what we're doing is if you can help spread my word then it becomes a community and we can start helping dogs and when you learn from what I'm doing it allows you to teach other people as well you know talking about the truest thing I'm not gonna follow this pattern where I want to be like uh, uh, you know making money uh, doing stupid things to dogs we're, we're helping them viscerally and we're helping to change lives this is my uh, my honor to be able to do that and I am really, really very fortunate to have this happening for me. And it's uh, a gift from God, which I'm sharing. And, um, you know, thank you so much. Everybody take care and see you tomorrow night.